now come on let's lift our voices and our hands to the lord and let's just magnify the name of jesus oh let's create the atmosphere of praise and worship in this house in the name of the lord jesus we give you glory and honor we lift you up and magnify you almighty god now clap your hands to the lord and let's praise him hallelujah 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 praise the name of the lord let everybody say praise the lord Amen. I am delighted to be here, and this is one of the favorite places that I come. And uh, here in the last few years, I have traveled quite a bit. Thank God he's given me good help at home in Wiggins. But I'll tell you that when I come here, I just I don't feel any pressure. I feel like I'm just going for a family reunion. And I love the presence of the Lord that I feel when I come to this place. And, of course, it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it, how very, very special that Brother Scott Phillips and his family are to me. And uh, he's like a, a brother from another mother as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Amen. I love him dearly. And, uh, and I'm so thankful for the years ago that God brought him into my life. And I'm excited about what's happening at New Birth. Amen. Amen. Anybody excited? If you aren't excited, you can't get everybody else excited. So you got to get excited. <laughs> and I believe you are. Amen. And I thank you so much for coming out on a Friday night like he said. You could have went a lot of places tonight, but you're here, and I know that means a lot to him, it means a lot to me, and it means a lot to God. Amen? Amen. And these are perilous times that we live in. I know you're standing, and I'll try to be kind and, and not let you stand too long, but I, I, I thought I knew what the word perilous meant. I, I, you know, I've, I know, I think I know what it means when we say perilous. We think of dangerous times or times that we are in peril. But actually, when you go back to the original Greek of the word that was used, it actually means a time when you become so weary at your station that you let your guard down. And he was saying that the days would become wearisome, even for the righteous, and that we would stand our post and we would do what God wants us to do, but we would become increasingly weary until there was a very strong danger that we would let our guard down. And any man that is, or woman that is on post, I have to say woman now because they're letting our women go to the front line, so you have to say both now. <laughs> but any man or woman that would let down their guard at the post not only brings themselves in danger of the enemy, but opens up a way for the enemy to get in. Amen. Folks, these are perilous times. Everybody say perilous times. Perilous times. These are times when we will be stressed if we're not so busy being blessed. It really depends on what's going on between our ears, how we're going to look at life. And we can either look at life as a challenge or we can look at life as, as a conquest. You hear what I'm saying? I don't, I don't know if you noticed, maybe you did, but I was so stirred whenever I heard the announcement that the Vatican was going to have to find a new pope. Because according to Vatican prophecy, and I, I have confirmed this, I went and studied it, and according to Vatican prophecy, it says that this would be the last pope. I automatically knew that because the last two popes that they have brought in, and I do study a lot of end-time prophecy and teach it in conferences, but whenever I study this, I, I knew, I said, you know, they're going to get a younger pope this time because the last two were, were very, very old, and they weren't able to handle the job, and the challenge of heading the Catholic Church in this day and age is much greater than it's ever been. Yes. And wouldn't you know, yesterday, the Cardinals made the statement that they were definitely going to look for a younger man. Mm. Folks, to see a new Pope come at this moment, when all of the other New World Order is coming into place, when nations are losing their sovereignty and they are becoming one nation in the world, and all your leaders are not only allowing it, but they are propagating it in the world. We are in perilous times. I believe that, you know, I'm not here to say that the, the next pope is going to be an evil man. I'm not here to say that. But what I am here to say is that these men do not realize the role that they will play, but they will fulfill the book of Revelation whether by their own evil design or just the fact that they are here at this moment and God is sovereign and he will have his way and the word of God will come true. 
Amen? You know, somebody say, well, are you saying the Pope's going to be evil? I don't have to say that. Whoever's in power right now, we know this, that everyone in power is under the authority of God himself, and they will do according to the will of God. Amen? Anybody believe that? We are in perilous times. You know what that means? It means that you've got to hold your guard. It means you can't get weary in well-doing now. You've got to hold your guard. You, For the sake of you, your family, and your church, you have got to hold your guard. You cannot get weary by the hour. You cannot get weary by the spirit of this age. But you've got to say, God, now is not the time for me to lay down anything. But now is the time for me to pick more up. Now is not the time for me to get slack. But it's time for me to tighten up. If I've ever praised, I need to praise now. If I've ever worshipped, I need to worship now. If I've ever had a prayer life, I need a prayer life now. If I've ever been faithful to the house of God, I've got to be faithful now. Oh, clap your hands to the Lord and worship Him. These are perilous times. God bless you. He said for me to share my heart. Well, that is what's been burning in my heart for the last few days. But I want to take you to Galatians, the fourth chapter, and verse number four. And once again, thank you for the liberty that I feel in this pulpit tonight. Galatians, the fourth chapter, and verse number four. A very familiar passage of Scripture. Galatians, the fourth chapter, and verse number four. The Bible says, when the fullness of time was come. Everybody say, when the fullness of time was come. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, so now we know where the son came from. He was made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Would you read that with me? But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. I want you to turn and look at somebody and say, I was destined to be blessed. Turn to somebody else and tell him, I was destined to be blessed. There's a saying that's going around in my church right now because of a message I preached not too long ago. And I told them that when someone asks you, how are you? This is how you should answer. I am blessed of the Lord and highly favored of God. Turn to somebody say, I am blessed of the Lord and highly favored of God. Put your Bible down, lift your hands, and would you ask the Lord just to speak to your heart in the next few moments to challenge you? Lord Jesus, we give you praise and glory, and we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for each one that is here. We know that it's not accidental that anyone is in this place. And Father, we know you're going to talk to your children. You're going to minister to your children. And Lord, as you have told me in my heart, you have come to bless your children tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pronounce a blessing upon every household that is represented in this house, and I pray, God, that your spirit would move in this place with an impartation of your spirit that will not just be a thrill or a blessing, but that it can be a life-changing experience, dear God. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands to the Lord one more time? <laughs> Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. And everybody say amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. There's something in this verse in Galatians, the fourth chapter, that tells us something. And many times we must read between the lines because a lot of times when God is revealing his word. You know, one thing that I have been stressing on my radio broadcast, I'm doing verse-by-verse -verse commentary and with the book of Psalms, and I keep telling people, I know when you read the Bible, you call the Bible the word of God. But I want you to constantly remind yourself that when you're reading something, even if it's an account that a man wrote under the inspiration of God, that it is the voice of the Lord. And that sometimes God says things in a particular way, not as an accident, but it is holy writ, it is holy utterance, and the reason it was written that way is because that's what God said. Amen? So when you open the Bible and you begin to read, you are reading the voice of the Lord. You are reading the heart of the Lord. You're reading the intent of the Lord. A great way to know God is to read his word. Can you say amen? 
And there's some things in here that are not just said, but even, and, and in fact, when you go to the Greek, and, and I've been doing some of that lately, but when you go to the Greek, you actually find out that the words that were chosen that are a part of this verse were, were orchestrated by the Holy Ghost for particular persons, uh, for particular reasons, rather, and, and we're going to see that. And it says, when the fullness of time. Now, the idea in the Greek here, in the fullness of time, is that there was a plan. If there is a plan, there has to be a planner. Amen. Amen. So here God is trying to tell us this, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but I'm going to tell you something. There's something that you need to stress to your children, you need to stress to your grandchildren, because they're growing up in a world where they're being told that all of this happened by accident, that it's just happenstance and evolution, and I'm telling you what, that is the farthest from the truth. This was a created world, and there is a creator. Can somebody say amen? amen? And the only thing is that God looks at time backwards. He literally looks back from time and says, okay, now, when this item here occurs, then this right here will be fulfilled. And, and I'm going to show it first in the Old Testament in the physical, and then I'll fulfill it in the spiritual. I know that uh, Brother Sullivan has been teaching you about the tabernacle in the temple. The tabernacle in the temple is a type and shadow of approach to God in the Old Testament that is physical. It was the only way that man could possibly do it because man was limited only to the physical because he had not been born again yet. So the only way that he could serve God was through physical ceremony. The only way that he could please God was to do the ceremony and to do the commands and to follow what God said according to obedience. In the New Testament, we are doing it spiritually. There still is a brazen altar. And every one of you have probably been to it when you repented of your sins and asked God to forgive you of your sins. There still is a brazen labor, and many of us have been there because we have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, the priests would wash their hands in the labor, and there was blood on their hands. And so the water was mingled with blood. The blood is applied not only when you repent, but it's applied when you are, when you are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say Amen. And then, of course, there is a holiest of holies, and we are in it tonight. You press through the veil when you begin to praise him and get out of your flesh and into the spirit. That's when you got into the holiest of holies, where one man could only go one time a year. You're in privilege to go at least three times a week. If not, whenever you want to do it when you're at home and go into your own prayer room, we can walk into the holiest of holies anytime we want to. We have the blessing of Moses. And we have been given the privilege of relationship like Moses. Can you say amen? But the fullness of time, in other words, there had to be, according to the Greek, there had to be certain things that happened in order for you to get to this place. Now, there had to be a certain route that I went in order for me to get to Clinton today. Whenever I left Wiggins, I had to go a certain way. I, you know, I couldn't say, well, I think I'll go south and see if I can end up there. Or I think I'll go west and see if I end up there. No, you know, I had to go due north because that is the direction. And in order for me to fulfill my obligation of being here tonight, there were some things that I were, was required to do and obey. The fullness of time is not just indicating a moment on the clock, but it's indicating that there were certain things that had to take place in order to set the stage for the coming of the Son of God. Now, we also understand it says God sent forth his son made of woman. The word forth there is to come from the womb. So what he was saying, the reason it has this connotation made of woman is because the way that God brought forth his son, capital S-O-N, was in a earthly body through the womb of an earthly woman. And she and he was made under or according to the law. In other words, what we have to understand here is that Jesus Christ had to conform to every rule that was in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ was bound to every law that every other Jew had to obey in the Old Testament. I know that when we read about Jesus, we read about him in the New Testament, in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And I don't want to confuse anybody, but in reality, uh, legally, if you please, the first part of Matthew, the first part of Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. 
Because the only way that a will can be activated is when the person that wrote the will dies. And as long as you hear Jesus talking, then you're still in the Old Testament. That is why you see Jesus going to the temple. You see him going to Passover. You see him uh, celebrating the Passover. You see him doing all the things that he is supposed to do. You see him fulfilling the law. He is bound and obligated to the law. Jesus Christ came into the world and he lived in the Old Testament so that he could prepare you for the coming of the New Testament. How many is glad you got the New Testament? When there were sacrifices made, Jesus was there. You remember the time at Hallelujah whenever he went to the temple and they were pouring out the silver vessel of water that they had got from the springs of Jihon? The springs of Jihon is still flowing today. And they would bring that pitcher in great ceremony and they would pour it out as an offering unto the Lord. And all the people would shout unto God. And it was called the Hallelujah because they actually believed the angels from heaven came down in the spirit and joined with the praisers on earth and everybody began to praise God for his glory and for his power and for his life life-giving power. And they poured the water out, and Jesus is standing there. He is a participator. He is part of an Old Testament ceremony, but something jumps out of him, and he says, oh! Everybody says, who's in pain? Lord have mercy, who is that? Oh, that people would come and ask me, and I would give them to drink water, and they would never thirst again. It's for whosoever will let him come. And all the people are saying, wait a minute, wait, that's not part of the ceremony. You're not priesthood. You don't need to be saying that. What do you think you're doing? You're messing up our tradition. There was just sometimes that even though he was in an Old Testament world, he was God Almighty, and he did have a problem sometimes with man's tradition. Can somebody say Amen. And things had to be laid in place and things had to happen and and all of this took place and he was made under the law but he was made for a particular reason and that was to redeem them that were under the old covenant. He came to redeem them that were under the Mosaic law. He had to come into the law to be able to redeem us out of the law. The law has not been abolished, folks, but the law has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. He met every prerequisite of the law. Can somebody say amen? Amen. And he was made under the law according to the law. In other words, he was made in a body that had the facsimile of sinful man. And yet, because he was God in the flesh, by the power of God, the man Jesus surrendered to the God Father in him, and he was able to remain sinless and uh, and be able to be the Passover lamb that would be offered once and for all. But he makes it clear why he came. After all the fullness, you know what I see when I see at the fullness of time? I see the Lord God Almighty saying, oh, I can't wait. I just can't wait. You know, it just seemed like time just going by so slow and I made it. But I just can't wait. He's just pacing the floor. When the fullness of time is come, it's almost like a a man that, you know, years ago, now they go into the delivery room. But at one time, Daddy had to stay out in the waiting room while Mama was in the delivery room. And, And you'd see these young fathers and they'd just be pacing the floor. I remember when I was a kid that I went there one time and, and these young guys are just pacing the floor looking at their watch trying to hear through the door thank God now they let them go in but, but you see it's like he's waiting on that moment when the fullness of time is come can I tell you something God was saying I can't wait I can't wait till that time comes when I can robe myself in flesh can't wait till that time comes whenever I will appear as a little baby and I will profound the wisest of men upon the earth can't wait till I get to come and, and when I'm born in that manger and put in that manger, born in that stable, then I'm going to be able to make a difference in the world. I can't wait to be able to hold them. I can't wait to be able to touch them. I can't, be, can't wait to be able to heal them. I can't wait to be able to raise their dead. I can't wait to show them what life is really all about. I can't wait to abolish the physical and implant the spiritual. I'm going to take them out of this old covenant that I was the one who orchestrated, but when it has served its purpose and the fullness of time has come, then I will implement a new covenant. In the fullness of time, why did he do it? Why in the world did God himself alter his comfort? 
You know, yes, he was a man, but yes, he was God. And I don't know about you, but if I was God in a fleshly body and you slapped me in the face, I'd want to hit you so hard it'd take you a month to get back. You know what I'm talking about? God's not used to being treated like that. When he even thinks it in heaven, the angels were doing it. His will was automatic. Nobody argues with God. You don't argue with Yahweh. You don't argue with Jehovah God. He, there is no equal to him. He is beyond anyone. He is the highest power, the highest authority. Who are you going to appeal to if you don't like what God said? And yet now he's being slapped. His beard is being pulled out. He's being beaten. He is being questioned by these self-righteous hypocrites. You know why Jesus looked at those guys and said, you're a bunch of snakes and you're a bunch of hypocrites? It's because he's standing there and they're accusing him and they're asking him questions and he knows their birthday, he knows their mama's name, and he knows what they did last night in their pious robes of regency and walking around putting everybody in intimidation and, and portraying their own righteousness and making it greater than the righteousness of God, that just caused God to get a little bit stirred. But you know what? The Bible says that there's a reason why he came to redeem us. The word redeem there means ransom. As far as God is concerned, Adam and Eve were kidnapped and held for ransom. What is the ransom, Satan? You know what it is. You said it yourself. There is no remission of sin except for the shedding of blood, but it's got to be perfect blood. And God said, no problem. I'll acquire a body, and I'll do it myself. You know what, folks? There's a reason why he did it, and that was that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, I preach a lot about sonship, but I'm not talking about sonship tonight. Yes, it is an eternal purpose. Yes, it is our destiny. It, it is what God declared for us. We can walk as sons and daughters of God. We, 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 our Father is there to help us, and he has empowered us, and he's given us his name, and he's given us his authority, and we are the representatives. Now, I don't know how you feel, but I'm just going to tell you how I feel, and I've been around the world preaching this, and I hadn't had anybody argue with me, but I'm going to tell you something. I believe the apostolic church of the living God is the reigning body of authority and power in the earth today. A little stronger amen would be better there. I believe that before the rapture takes place, every government on the face of the earth is going to have to deal with the question, what do we do with these apostolics? You know why? Because we can go into private audience with our father, the king, and we can present to him what we see and what we need in our, in our world, and we can begin to, to tell him and, and talk to him and, and entreat him, and he's already given us authority and power. He's already given us his name, and I'm telling you, if there's something going around you that is not God's will, all you've got to do is get a few people together to Together and hit your knees and say, God, the church is praying. The church is praying in focused prayer. The church is joining together in unity and faith. And we believe that we can change the world. I believe God's church is a world changer. Does anybody believe that? I was in Greece last year, and I don't know if I've been here since I was in Greece. I don't know if it was before or after. Right after, okay. And I told you about when we were in the hotel and, and uh, <laughs> when I walked in there, all those Libyans scattered, you know, from Gaddafi's government. And it was kind of a strange situation. But I'm going to tell you something. When we got in there and we started having church, the first thing we did, and, and this is awesome, you, you had people that were, that were Indian there. You had people that, of course, were Greek there. You had Armenians that were there. And we were walking around in this large ballroom that heaven knows what they have done in this room. But we're walking around in this large ballroom before the service started and everybody is praying and everybody's touching God and, and people are all talking in their own languages and then there are a bunch of us that are talking in tongues and, and the power of God started moving in that place and literally you could feel the power of God in that room. And I'm walking around and all of a sudden I get this strange thought that goes through my mind which I'm known to have that to happen occasionally. And that is, do you think that I am contained in just this room. 
But can you believe, Michael, that right now because you have called my name and you have declared this to be a stronghold of truth and righteousness and you have called my presence from heaven and into the earth and into this place, that I am not permeating every room in this hotel, in this, in this high-rise building, that every corner and every square inch of this building is being permeated by the power of the Holy Ghost. He said, Michael, can you believe that because you have called me, the sons of God have called their father into action, that I am not moving in your behalf. And if there was anybody that was going to do anything to anybody in this place, that they have no power to do it now because my spirit has sequestered them and my angels have encamped about my people and you are safe. Let me tell you something, church. We got to get a mindset. I know I preached the last time I was here about the ecclesia, but, uh, uh, which is the body, the reigning body of God upon the face of the earth. But I want you to understand God did everything he did in robing himself in flesh, in coming to live among us, uh, in walking among us, in experiencing grief, in experiencing the, the feelings that all of us have felt and the temptations that all of us have felt for one reason, and that is so he could adopt you as his child. You are destined to be blessed. You are destined to be blessed. Does anybody believe that? I do not believe in predestination to heaven or hell. I don't see how in the world anybody can teach that because it is for whosoever will let him come. People are not born to go to heaven and they're not born to go to hell. And you know what? He, we call it salvation. He calls it marriage. One of the greatest revelations that I received this past year, the Lord said, you call it salvation. That's your term. I got saved on such and such day. No, you didn't. You got married. You call it salvation. He calls it marriage. You want to prove it to you? What's the first thing we're going to do when we get to heaven? We're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. I believe the reception usually comes after the ceremony. So the first thing that's got to happen is you've got to fall madly in love with Jesus so you're ready to commit yourself to marriage. And then once you have committed yourself to marriage, you've got to live like a married man or a married woman. That means there is no other love in your life and there is nobody that's going to draw your attention away. You are in love with Jesus and you're going to serve him and you're going to do everything you can. Every waking moment is to make him happy. Every waking moment is to find out what makes him happy. We, we call it salvation. He calls it marriage. And I'm telling you, when you start committing yourself to it, you've got to understand that's why he's a jealous God. It's because you belong to him. He gave you his name. Ooh, somebody's getting it. And the reason that we're on the face of the earth is so that he can implement his kingdom upon the face of the earth. He has left the queen of heaven upon the face of the earth, better known as the church, that we might be able to implement the will of the king of heaven that has ascended into glory. And one day he will come back and get his bride and we will be forever at his side in the new Jerusalem that he has prepared. You call it salvation. He calls it marriage. You call it sacrifice. He calls it dowry. He bought you because he wanted you. You know what? It might not be a bad idea in today's world that if a young man wants a young woman that he needs to pay something for her. He might be more willing to keep her longer. Take better care of her. Ooh, I'm going to shout if nobody else does. You see, whenever a young man saw a young woman, the first thing he had to do is he had to go to daddy and say, how much you want for her? And that dowry was to set her free. Now, that's a kind of odd situation. I'm going to set you free from your daddy. Well, you know what? Jesus paid his blood to set us free from our first daddy. 
Jesus said, you're of the, your father, the devil. You don't even know who your father is. You think your father's Jehovah. Your father's a devil because you're walking in self-righteousness. You're walking in religion and not relationship. You don't have a relationship with God. I don't know you. And so you can't say that you're one of mine. Let me tell you something. We've got to understand this is all about marriage. This is all about him buying us. And why did he buy us? It's because he wanted us to be a part of his family. It's because he intends to spend time with us. It's because we're going to spend eternity, not as just another number in heaven, but you, my friend, are a part of his bride. You are a part of his bride. And you know what? You're not here because you got lucky. You were courted. He gave you gifts. He promised you some things. He found you brokenhearted because your other lover had jilted you and didn't keep his word and you were broken hearted and your life was in shambles and you didn't know what to do with your heart and along came Jesus. How many can say when you were, when you found him, you were broken, you were a mess, your life was a wreck and he found you. How many's glad he found you? But he didn't just find you. He said, all right, what do I got to pay? to set them free. What I, they made a mistake. They've chosen wrong. They've been in slavery for 4,000 years. What do I do to set them free? You know why? He didn't do it so you'd bless him. He did it because he wanted to bless you. Folks, you're not here by accident. You're here because the Lord called you. You're here because the Lord wanted you. You're here because the Lord drew you. And then when you heard that preacher begin to preach like you were the only one in the house. How many remember that night? And you said, my God, everybody else can go home. He's talking to me. And then he gave an altar call. And you came to the altar. And you repented of your sins. And you begin to ask God to forgive you. And you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then the marriage ceremony began with you taking on the name of your new lover of the one that loves you, the lover of your soul. I'm telling you, they call it salvation, but when you really look at it, it's a marriage. And you were not predestined to go to heaven. It was by your choice to obey. You see, no one is forced into loving Jesus. Nobody's going to be a forced bride. That would be illegal and immoral but he found you and he visited you and he promised you how many remember the promises he made to you let me tell you something saying of God I feel the Holy Ghost so strongly right now if he's made any promise to you you can rest assured that he'll bankrupt heaven to make them come to pass do you realize how special you are. Now, I don't want you to walk out of here with your buttons busting off and, and you're walking around like you're just God's gift to the earth and that, that you're better than everybody else around you because you know what? We're all ranked sinners if it wasn't for the grace of God, if it wasn't for the fact that he drew us, if it wasn't for the fact that he brought us in, if it wasn't for the fact that he washed away our sin, we would be just as bad or worse than anybody that's out there tonight doing whatever they're doing on Friday night. But by the grace of God. Why? Because he paid a ransom to set you free. And he that the Son has set free is free indeed. And then you chose. Everybody say, he chose me. And then I chose him. Doesn't that sound familiar? Do you take this to be your lawful wedded wife. I do. And do you, sir, or ma'am, rather, do you take this, this man to be your lawful wedded? Yes, I do. It was two choices. There is no predestination to salvation or marriage. It's because he found you and you chose him. But now that it's happened, you are the house. You may not be in the household right now. The new Jerusalem is up there and it's kind of empty. It's waiting on us. 
It's designed for us. Made with us in mind. It's going to be the color scheme you like. Well, everybody likes gold. Can I have an amen? Oh, now some of y'all trying to be holy, but you know you like gold. You can't live with it, but you can't live without it. Let me tell you something. He has prepared the place for us. You are of the household of his house. You are his bride. There's a little separation going on right now, but it's not for any reason except there are others. You know, if God had his perfect will, when you got the Holy Ghost, you just would have evaporated and that have been it. You'd just been with Jesus. But he lets you keep your body. Now, sometimes that's not a blessing. Because we have to deal with the flesh all the time. We have to deal, to deal with the desires of the flesh. And so he lets you keep your body so you can go out and reach other bodies. You see, that is why we're here. We are the salvation agent in the world. And let me tell you something. I have been around people that were happily married. When I was a single, I had a dear friend of mine, a young man that got married before I did. I got so sick and tired of hearing about Abigail. I mean, he got married before I did, and, and I'm going to tell you something. He just, he, oh, man, she is just, oh, she cooked me the best meal. Oh, man. You know what? It made me want to get married. Lord, have mercy. I go home to an empty apartment, and there ain't nobody there, and I have to cook whatever I eat. I have to wash my own clothes, and I have to sit there in the dark by myself, and you know what? This is just not the way to live. And, and then he'd be talking about Abigail. wasn't anything inappropriate, just talking about what a wonder she was and how great she was and what she had done for him in his life. I got sick and tired of hearing about Abigail till I found Pam. Let me tell you something. You get around people that are happily married and make you want to be married. You get around people. You know, I, I've heard guys before say stuff about their wife that I thought if I went to the house, it'd be a grizzly bear that would answer the door. And I know it's only hearing it from their side. But I'm going to tell you something. No wonder the people that are around them don't want to get married. You know the point I'm trying to make? If you want people to know the lover of your soul, you got to live like you are happily married. Amen. You have, you see, he blessed us and we are blessed. Turn to somebody and say, I am blessed. Say, I was destined to be blessed. Because I chose. You see, I could have walked away, but I chose. And because I chose, I was destined to be blessed. But more than that, you know what else you were destined to do? You were destined to be a blessing. I want to challenge this church. I've challenged several congregations. I had one uh, man that I challenged that lived in Oklahoma. He told me, he said, let me tell you something. He said, I laughed whenever you challenged me with this. He said, I thought that, Brother Dobbs, he just comes up with the craziest stuff. He said, but when I got back home to Tulsa, I started doing it. And he said, you would not believe the things that started coming back to me almost every day. And, and this is what I challenged. I said, I'll tell you what. What if God said, I have made you my ambassador. I have made you the representative of my kingdom. I have made you my bride. You are a representative of the love and the care and the relationship of what it is to know and love God Almighty. What if you went out and you said, as I have been blessed, so will I bless others. And you spent your time every day reaching out to people just to bless them. I don't talk about just giving them money or, or taking care of their bills. I, I'm talking about blessing them. Uh, let me tell you something. You have the right to say, uh, I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have a right, who else would? You're his bride. And he went back and he said, you know what? He said, I, I, the man, uh, the, the first it was the waitress that came to the table and, and, and she brought and filled up his tea and he said, I bless you in Jesus' name. And she looked at him. You know, she probably used to being blessed out, but she was blessed. And he said it felt awkward at first, but she looked at him and then she turned around and walked, didn't say anything. And so whenever she came and poured some more tea in there, he said, bless you, sister, bless you.
And he just, he said, uh, when the man came, he said, I came out to the, the mailbox and the postman was coming at the same time. Let me tell you something. If you start doing that, you'll start having meetings you didn't know you'd ever have, running into people you never knew you wanted to meet. And let me tell you why. Because it is God's will that he bring a blessing upon every person he is reaching out. Don't you understand? He courted you and he wants to court others that are around you. And the best way for him to do it is to use you to bless them. He met the postman. He said, the guy gave him his mail. He said, bless you, man. He said, there might be some bills in there. He said, bless you anyway. He said, I just got in the, he, I got in the habit of doing it. He said, all of a sudden, I just started doing it. And then he didn't think about it. He said, all of a sudden, he said, I, I went to pay a bill. And the lady said, hold on a minute. How much you say you owe? And he said, I owe $118. She said, no, you don't. It's paid in full. And he said, well, who paid it? She said, I don't know, but you have zero balance. Hallelujah. I'm blessed. And whatever you reap, you're going to sow. Is this a biblical principle? Oh, we love to rejoice in the fact that I'm blessed. I'm blessed and highly favored of God. Yes, you are. But the reason you're blessed and highly favored of God is because he wants you to go out and show them the blessing of the Lord. Show them not money hanging out of your pocket or a fine car that you're driving, but show them by your mouth. Show them by your grace. Show them by your love and by your actions and by your compassion. Bless them instead of blessing them out. The people of God need to be blessed. Blessers. We are a representative of heaven and God has blessed me. Now I will go out and bless others. A very interesting thing and I'm about finished. Well, no, I'm about to close. I'm not finished. <laughs> Might as well be honest about you. How do you finish this? He told him, I'm sending you out two by two. Go to the cities that I have sent you. If they receive you, leave your blessing in that home. Huh now? We all quick to curse somebody, but we don't want to bless them? Leave your blessing. You know what he was saying? You have the power. In your spirit, in the Holy Ghost that's in you, in your positioning with God, who has greater authority besides the king than the queen? And I'm not preaching new revelation, but maybe just opening your understanding to something you already know, and now you're putting the pieces together and it's making it very clear. You know what? I need to be blessing somebody every day. That is why I'm here. If I can bless them, okay, they're addicted. I'm gonna bless them with liberation. I'm gonna, may the Lord set them free. I'm gonna pray a blessing upon you. You look at somebody and they've done you wrong and you say, I'm going to pray a blessing on you. You know, so many times we get angry at people. The people of the living God should not get angry. We should have compassion and say, God, it is a spirit that is in them that's causing them to do this. And rather than me get angry like every other human being would, I am going to pray for them that they will be delivered. Look beyond what they're doing and see why they're doing it. When people attack you and maybe you, oh, I got to hurry. My Lord, I thought I was finished. People attack you and you don't even know them. They don't even know you, but they just lash out at you and you wonder, what in the world did I do? They don't even know me. Why are they doing this to me? I'll tell you what it is. It's a spirit. And you have a choice of whether coming under the influence of that spirit or setting that person free from that spirit. And it all depends on whether you curse them or bless them. Somebody coming out against you, guess what? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we wrestle against spiritual wickedness, high places, principalities, and powers. That's what we wrestle against. So if somebody's opposing you, it's not them. It's a spirit. Don't get even with them Take that spirit to task in Jesus' name and say, you're not going to make me miserable and you're going to stop making them a victim too. Amen. If you can pray for their deliverance, it'll also set you free from your problem. 
Come on, somebody. I'm talking about being a blessing. You run into a drug addict, you run into somebody whose life is a wreck, you run into somebody who's filled with hatred and anger and maliciousness and hostility and you look in their eyes and all you see is dark pools of of sin and degradation and they hate everybody that's around them. What are you going to do? You're going to get offended and walk away? Or are you going to say, I bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless your soul with light. I bless your soul with the peace of God. I bless your soul with the power of salvation. I'm going to bless you. Son, you may be angry at the world, but I want you to know there's not going to be a day that I don't hit my knees and call your name in prayer. I'm not going to blast you. I'm going to bless you. And when I begin to bless you, you're going to be set free because my blessings are not empty words, but they are by the authority and the power of the Most High God who I am married to. I have not only been destined to be blessed, I have been destined to be a blesser. Anybody destined to be a blesser? When you walk around, you know, I I used to have a dear sister. I I worked for a gospel radio station. She would come in sometimes. I'm closing. She would come in sometimes, and she would bring her radio program from her son. And her son was such an anointed preacher, great guy. And she'd come in, and I'd say, Sister Von Seal, how are you doing? I am blessed of the Lord and highly favored of God. And she just about cut a rug right there. And I thought, well, that's nifty. That's neat. That's that's neat. I like that. And I even used it a few times. But it wasn't until just a couple years ago I got the revelation of that. Don't think I think too much of myself, but you are looking at a son of God. My daddy owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the gold that is under the hills, the diamonds that are under the gold, and everything else that you know of. That's my daddy. But not only am I knowing him as my father, but through the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, I know him as the groom. And so it is even a deeper relationship, greater than imaginable. And he has filled us with his spirit and authority so that we can be Jesus to everybody we meet. And the only ones that Jesus did not bless are the ones that were hypocrites who knew they were already wrong and were justifying it. That's the only ones that he did not bless. I'm not going to bless a hypocrite. Somebody that's not really what they are and they know it. There's a difference between a hypocrite and a struggler. I have patience with strugglers. I mean, if they just want to be better and they're doing everything they can, I have patience with that. But if somebody's just going to make reasons why they don't have to do that because it's not convenient or everybody else is doing it, let me tell you something. If you are truly in love with God, you can't be a hypocrite more than 10 minutes. I'm not going to bless a hypocrite. But there's not anybody else that I'm going to meet, no matter what they're doing, what they look like, that I'm not going to bless. Because I know that I have the authority to. I know that it's not empty words. This man told me, I cannot believe it, but when I made blessing a lifestyle, I got a raise. I got contracts that had been telling me no. I got a bill paid that I don't even know who paid it. And he said, somebody came and got my car. They had bumped into it the week before. And they had left the color of their car on his car. He knew what car it was because there was only one car in the parking lot where he worked. It was that color and it was a small parking lot. So he left a note on him and said, I bless you. I know you didn't mean to do it. And I just want you to know no hard feelings. I bless you in Jesus' name. That person came and got his car. Somehow he snuck around, got one of his co-workers to get his keys, got his car, took it to the car wash and washed it and brought it back and parked it. And it was cleaner, he said, than it had been in years. He said, I walked out, I'm looking at my car, it's shining. I'm going, no, that ain't my car. My car had wash me written all over it. But this man had caught the spirit of what he had done. And you know what? I've got to say one more thing. 
I was reading on the internet just the other day about a young boy who was dying of a terminal disease, and he began to write positive things to soldiers, just writing at random to the names of soldiers that he knew were serving overseas. He would write letters to them, and he said, I'm a young man. I'm such and such years old. My name is Brandon, and, and I'm dying of leukemia, but I'm spending the last days of my life blessing those that are fighting for our country and liberating us from, from the world system and the things that are going on. And he just wrote letters of encouragement to total strangers. You know what happened? His letter, his mailbox started filling up because people on YouTube had heard about it. People on Facebook had heard about it. And all of a sudden, he's sitting there in his chair in front of his bed, and there is a mountain of letters that are all around him from people that wrote him to thank him for what he did. That boy, went to, he, when he did pass away, he went away with a legacy of what he had done. Folks, there's just something in everybody that if there's somebody they meet that will bless them, that it will turn them around and it will give them hope. And if it can happen in the physical with a young man just doing what he felt to do, what can God do through us that are filled with his spirit, given the authority of faith? And when we bless, it's not just words, but God honors it. Jacob is laying in his bed, 12 sons around him. And there in his feeble, frail condition, he points to Reuben. Reuben, you were my firstborn. You were my strength. I called you Reuben. It means behold a son. But you have been as unstable as water. You have done despicable and terrible things. And therefore you have lost your birthright and I will give it to another. And then he went to right down the line, Judah. Judah, everybody that's a king in Israel will come from your house if they're God ordained. And you, Benjamin, and you, Joseph, though the, the slayers tried to slay you and the archers tried to kill you, you have been blessed and prospered in the sight of of your enemy and you are doubly blessed you know what he did he gave Joseph the birthright but he walked he walked all around that bed pointing to every one of those brothers and everything he said about them was not just empty words but God honored everything that that dying man said to his sons the greatest blessing that you can do is to start in your own home Bless your children. Don't curse them. Bless them. Fathers, lay your hands on your children and pray a blessing over them. Put your arm around them and tell them how special they are. Tell them they're holy seed. Tell them that the reason they were born in this home is because they've got a destiny and God wanted to work with them at an early age so he could get them ready for a great destiny. That they're, they're not in bondage because they can't live like everybody else. They've selected specially so that they could be used in a very special way. Come on, bless your children. Bless your grandchildren. Instead of telling them what they can't do, you need to find something they can do and pat them on the back and thank them that they can. I, th I know our young people struggle with sin, but I'm going to tell you something. We need to bless our young people because they're living closer to God than a lot of young people are even on their worst day. Come on, somebody. We have got to bless them. And the thing about is that everything he said, God didn't have to honor. But the Lord said, Jacob, you're my son. And whatever you say, I'm going to do. Whatever your righteous judgment speaks, it will become reality. And whatever you speak into your son's lives, that is what they will be. Your blessing will either give them ability or limit them, depending on what you say. And if God honored the blessing of a father, then how much more will he honor the blessing of his bride upon the people that are in our lives that need a blessing so bad? I am destined to be blessed, but the way I'm going to be blessed is to be a blesser. 
Does anybody want to be a blesser? Anybody want to be a blesser? Can you think of somebody right now that you want to be a blessing to? Can you think of somebody right now that you want to pray a blessing on them right now? And this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand and lift your hands, and I want you to pray a blessing on them right now. And then I want you to go to them physically, and I want you to tell them, I have prayed a blessing on you. And I, it doesn't, I'm not talking about somebody that's doing everything right. I'm talking about somebody God's laid on your heart right now. Whatever, whoever God's laid on your heart right now, that is the one he's talking about. Would you lift your hands right now and pray a blessing? Would you pray a blessing on that person right now? Lord Jesus, by the power and the authority of your spirit, dear God, I have tried to be obedient to what you told me to do tonight. And I'm asking you right now, God, to help these people realize that as they speak, they are speaking by the authority of the Holy Ghost that lives in them. That their words are not vain, their words are not just words. But as they speak under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, would you let the Holy Ghost pray through you right now? Would you let the Holy Ghost pray a blessing upon that person through you? You just become a vessel, a transfer, a conduit of the blessing right now. And let the Holy Ghost pray through you. Lord God, I'm asking you right now to bless them. I mean, I pray a blessing upon their head right now. I pray a blessing upon their family. Lord, I'm asking you to bless them more than you've ever blessed me. I'm not praying selfishly, but I'm praying a blessing upon them, a blessing of salvation, a blessing of deliverance, a blessing of healing. Come on, you know somebody. God's put them on your heart right now, and right now by the authority of the Holy Ghost, you don't even realize the power that your prayer has right now. You don't realize what God is doing this very moment, but the influence of this service has just just gone out the doors of this building and the angels of the Lord are going to perform what you are praying right now because you are the children of God, because you are the adoption of sons. Come on, saint of God. Pray a blessing of deliverance. Pray a blessing of power and prosperity. Whatever it is God wants you to pray, I want you to pray it into their life and believe that God is going to do it. I bless them in Jesus' name. I bless them in Jesus' name. I bless them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. Instead of being angry at your daughter or your son, why don't you bless them? Pray a blessing of deliverance, a blessing of salvation, Lord. I pray a blessing of your voice to speak into their life and to draw them back to Calvary. Lord, I pray a blessing of conviction upon their life that will cause them to feel your love and not your condemnation and to feel the drawing arms of God. I pray the blessings of the arms of the Lord that will wrap around their soul and make it almost undeniable huh? the presence of God that will draw them back into the fold. Come on, saint of God, you have the authority, you have the power, and you have the ability. I am destined to be blessed, but I've also been destined to be a blesser. I am highly favored of God. And because I am a recipient of his favor, I have the power to give his favor to others. I have the power to reach out to others and bring them into his presence. Hallelujah. Now thank God that he heard your prayer. There was a discharge in the spirit. There was angels that left this place that have been deployed to do his will. Do you believe that? Would you thank God for that right now? God, I believe you're sending forth angels to do your will, ministering spirits to bring the blessing that we have spoken tonight in Jesus' name. God bless you. Clap your hands to the Lord. Let's worship him. Can we worship him? Lord bless you. What a mighty word from the Lord tonight. Oh, hallelujah. 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 I've heard it said that uh, either we can be like Jesus and be the advocate or we can be like the devil and be an accuser. Amen. I want to be a blesser, don't you? Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Thank you, Brother Dobbs, for reminding us. Amen. And maybe some of you revealing to you who we are in the Lord. Amen. We are the salt of the earth. Amen. The only way salt's any good is you got to shake it out. 
Come on now. Amen. I like some salt on my food. It's no good in the shaker. Amen. I challenge you. It's so good to have our visitors here with us tonight. Amen. Very wonderful having you here with us.